Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bright Ops, and welcome back to our mellow. Now, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different today. See, last time we played this, we played the single player tutorial to show off the game, but we're not going to be playing the game itself in this episode. See, a while back, the creators of our mellow decided to unleash, well, to release a number of a number of stories about various characters involved in the set in the game we of course have the f basically the four basic heroes that you start with sauna amber mercurio and thane and other heroes are mentioned in their stories of their of their various factions we also have the Dragon Clan, who was one of the more recent releases, who also got a book. And we also, and I believe the first one that they released was that of the King. A, he got a two part, got a two parter. And today I'm going to be reading one of these part stories, just to. Try something new, because I have been told that I have a good speaking voice when it comes to telling stories and all that. And we're going to see if that is true. The King, Part 1. Where did you say he came from? The light in the farmhouse was dim. A scant few candles flickered in their wicks, sat low amongst mounds of wax. Night had fallen only minutes before, but heavy clouds held back the moon and blanketed hill and dale in thick darkness. The squirrel farmer and her hired hands gathered outside the small, tile-tilted tile doorway leading into the ba back room. There, laying in the bed just beyond the threshold, was the strangest creature any of them had ever seen. It looked like a cat. Similar eyes, pointed ears, and face but was at least four times the size of any they had seen. Where had he come from? The farmer repeated the question. One of the hired hands, a, badgered name, a badger named Gap, pointed to the wind window across the room. Found him in the woods just yon, mi Mrs. Missus Isabel. Past the winter we wheat. Was laying there, dead to the world. Who do you think he is? Isabel crossed her arms, feeling more than a bit uncomfortable having such a massive, menacing-looking creature in her home. He's dressed like a... I don't know. Looks like one of them rich folk from Bit Rimwatch. The other farmhand, a raccoon named Pimp, squinted in the dim light. All them purples and the gold trim, probably worth a scotto or two. Well, he ain't poor whatever he's fr wherever he's from, Gap said. He turned back into the main room of the farmhouse, where a tightly wrapped roll of heavy canvas lay atop the sturdy kitchen table nearby. It was marked in strange lettering, though its impossible its meaning was impossible to discern. This was right next to him in the woods, some kind of travelling bundle. He pushed the rolled up canvas, unfurling it over the table for them. Its contents, a thick binding of oblong, Rectangular cards, brushes, and ink bottles slid ne neatly into canvas strips affixed to the interior of the roll, and a flat sheet of blanks, over blank over large parchment. Artist supplies, looks like. Custom made. Could be worth something. Hold up a moment, Isabel le leaned in, looking at the cards. They were decorated with vivid artwork, but something was strange about them. You're seeing this? She reached down and pulled one of the cards from the deck. It was a ghastly scene. An army of withered creatures standing about in a fallowed field, the sky covered in darkness. The land was plague-ravaged, destitute, and the artwork was moving. What kind of sorcery is that? Pym shrank back in terror. True enough, the cards seemed to possess some curious form of enchantment. The scene in Bez blazoned on the card shifted and moved, as if the beasts shown therein were actually there, waiting, watching. And that symbol in the corner, Gap pointed, I've seen that before. True enough, nestled in the corner of the card was a symbol familiar to all three of them. A coiled worm, black as tar, the age-old symbol of the rot. 
Isabel threw the card back on the pile and Rojas hastily rolled the canvas tight. That's enough excitement for tonight, I think. What about him? Perm muttered to the other room. We ain't leaving you here alone with that thing. I'll be fine, Isabel said. You and Gap go get some sleep. We've got work to do in the morning, same as always. The farmhands tr traded a nervous glance, but knew better than to argue with their employer. They lit a lantern and ventured outside, through the fields to where their homes laid beyond. Isabel watched as the glow from their lanterns slowly disappeared into the darkness. Soon, all was quiet. The creature in the back room started to stir. The squirrel returned to the bedroom door, arms crossed pen pensively. The cat, or whatever it was, turned and rolled about restlessly on the bed. What are you dreaming about, I wonder? Isabel sighed and turned back to the table, pulling out one of the rickety wooden chairs. She yawned, setting an arm on the table and her head on top of it. Dawn couldn't come soon enough. The next morning, Isabel woke with a s awoke with a start. The stranger wasn't in his bed. He was standing at the table across from her. The canvas roll was opened and he was checking the contents carefully. Isabel jumped in her chair, gasping aloud. The stranger winced apologetically, opening his mouth to speak. He said something to her then, but in a language as foreign as the lettering on his canvas folio, it flowed forth in a melodic cascade of deep but delicate intent intonation. I don't know that word. As if a feline purr had been given structure and form. I don't understand what you're saying, Isabel said. Do you understand me? The stranger reared back a bit, clearly surprised. He said something else, now leaning in, almost pleadingly. He seemed to be fumbling for words across a couple of different languages now, though none of them were familiar to the squirrel. Isabel sighed. All right, this isn't working. She pointed to herself. Isabel. She guessed gestured to the stranger, prompting a response. T he took a deep breath. Tau. Tau, Isabel repeated. Please calm down. Isabel stood slowly, reaching her arms out and placing them comfortably atop Pau's, Tau's massive paws flat against the table. He looked around the room, seemingly taking it all in for the very first time. Every item in the room was regarded with a kind of exotic curiosity. Then with a start, he noticed the window. Outside, a palisade of ver verdant pine wood stood tall against the distant blue mountains, piercing the sky like shades of shattered glass. Both trees and mountains appeared foreign to Tao. He bolted from the kitchen, out the door, and right into the surprised farmhands. Wild's warning, Gap explained, exclaimed, stumbling backwards into P Pim. The two cowered in the shadow of the massive feline, but Tao paid them no heed. He ran past them looking at the fields, the trees, the mountains. He started speaking again, quickly, close to panic. Tao! Isabel ran outside, stopping when she noticed the farmhands before her. Tao? Prim glanced at the stranger. That is name? What language is he speaking? I never heard of it bef before, Gap said. Tao is a strange name, isn't it? Isabel rolled her eyes and waved the two farmhands off. Enough of that now, he still needs to rest and you need to finish sowing the fields. Gap and Prim looked to Tao once more, who was finally starting to come to his senses. Surely everything's all right, Prim asked. Dandy, Isabel walked over to Tao and put her a paw on his arm. Hey, hey, she leaned forward, drawing his attention. He turned, and she nodded towards the farmhouse. Follow me. Want to show you something. Tao nodded in response and followed her into the farmhouse kitchen once again. Isabel pointed to a chair at the table. Sit. Sit. Tao, Tao tried the word on for size, and it sounded very strange coming from his mouth. Still, he knew what she would meant, and sat in one of the old wooden chairs, his bulk straining the wood. Isabel rummaged through round a few wooden chests, piles of linen and burlap scattering about, until finally she found what she was after. A rolled up piece of cloth, held in twain. She unfurled it and held it flat against the map, against, against the table. Sorry, skipped ahead a word. It was a map of Amello and its clan territories. Wolf, rat, bear, and rabbit. At the very center, where the territories converged, a large circle and the word Brimwatch dominated. 
Where are you from? Isabel asked. Tao stared blankly at her. Me? She gestured to herself, then to the floor. Here. She pointed at a small dot on the map, where the words Bellhaven Farm were written. You? She gestured to Tao. But he wasn't looking at the farm. He was looking at the larger map. The edges, the features, none of it was familiar. He looked despondent for a moment, then an idea struck him. He flipped the map upside down to its blank side, then pushed open his canvas roll nearby, pulling out a piece of charcoal wrapped in cloth. With the skill of a master artisan, Tao drew a new map on the back of Isabel's own, this one completely different from Armello. Tao marked areas with curious script, the same adorning the outside of the canvas wrapping, but none of those landmarks correlated with any Isabel knew of. She could make out symbols for rivers, mountains, cities, but to her they were simply lines on parchment. Yeah, Isabel sat down and sighed deeply, shaking her head much to Tao's disappointment. If that's where you're from, then you aren't from anywhere near here. They both sat in silence for several moments, before Isabel finally nodded towards Tao's canvas roll. What is that? She made an exaggerated shrug to help visualize the question, and Tao seemed to understand. He slid it before him and removed the deck of cards from within. He said something in his native tongue, but Isabel held up a paw, stopping him mid-sentence. Do you know what this means? She pointed a finger at the rot symbol emblazoned on the topmost card. Tao looked at her gravely. Rot. Isabel nodded. Why is this here? Tao said nothing, merely looking down at the card and what the squirrel perceived as sh was shame. He put the cards back in the canvas and rolled it up. Isabel sighed, knowing she would never get an answer out of him with their language barrier. This poor beast couldn't speak a word in their tongue, had no home, and probably didn't know a single soul anywhere in the territories. She would simply have to teach him the language to learn more, and if he was to stay on the farm, that meant he would need to pitch in and help tend to the land. So it was that Tao came to Amelo. As the months passed, Tao came to learn of the land he found himself in. He was no st longer a stranger, but a contributing member of Bellhaven Farm. Gone were his royal purples and gold, exchanged for a simple cloth tunic more befitting his new station in Armello. After a hard day's w work in the fields alongside a Isabella, Gap, and Pim, they would convene in the farmhouse for a shared dinner and he hearty conversation. It only took Tao a few weeks to pick up the basics of their language, but it took the rest of fall and all of winter before Tao had a full grasp of it. They learned scant few things about Tao across the months. Perhaps the largest res revelation was that Tao was a lion, not just a really big cat. Not that it mattered, there were no other lions in Armello. Other secrets, like where he came from, what was in the canvas roll he carried, and how exactly he had wound up in the woods that afternoon so long ago were things he kept to himself. It was a cool evening in early summer when Isabel finally decided it was time to learn more about her new hide hand. Their dinner, a hearty potato and turnip soup, spiced with garlic and served alongside a freshly baked rye, had just been finished, the pots and pans scrubbed clean. Gap and Pim bed goodnight and returned to their dwelling across the fields. Tao's makeshift hut sat adjacent to the main farmhouse, so he tarried tarried in the kitchen as Isabel slid the clean stew pot against the hearth. When he noticed the squirrels repeated glancing across the room, he cleared his throat. You've something on your mind, he said. His speech, while still sporting a heavy accent from what, wherever it was he'd come from, was now quite understandable. Or do I presume too much? I'm just thinking, Isabel idled near the hearth. You've come a long way here. Helped the farm? Helped me? Well, you helped me, Tao said. It would have seemed inappropriate to offer anything but my full effort. Oh, would it have? The squirrel couldn't help but laugh. The rough farmer's life had not yet robbed Tao of his impeccable manners. You still speak like royalty, she said. Tao went quiet. Isabel considered her words very carefully, knowing that this could be difficult. You are royalty, right? I was, 
The days were longer and it was still light enough to see the distant blue mountains when he looked out the window. But not any more. What happened? Tao appeared lost in thought for a moment before turning back to Isabel. My brother is Isaba. Isoba. You think that's how that's pronounced? He was king of our ki of our land. He ventured to the far front door and stood in the threshold, staring out at the wheel fields of now fully grown winter wheat. He was betrayed. We all were. By whom? Isabel asked. It's none of your. He stopped, noticing uh, Isabel's surprised expression. Wincing a bit, he carried on as if nothing had happened. It was the court mage, he said. He led a coup against Is Isabel. Isabel. When I tried to stay and fight, my brother had me stripped of my royal heritage. Isabel looked horrified. What? Why would he do such a thing? Royal guards cannot defy royalty, Tao said. I wanted to stay and fight, and they couldn't do anything to stop me. By stripping me of my birthright, the guards were able to drag me from the castle to the borders of our lands. You had no say. My feet touched the ground but a few times along the way, Tao said, hints of anger beginning to creep into his words. I love... loved my brother. I did. But when he exiled me, he doomed the kingdom our family ruled for generations. I tried to explain what would happen, but the royal guards had their orders, and I no command of, over them. He shut his eyes, dim candlelight glistening off unformed tears. They travelled with me for days, weeks, maybe months, I'm not certain. We walked beyond civilization, beyond the threshold of living creatures. His gaze drifted earthward. They all perished, one by one. I alone was left to face death itself at the edge of the world. Isabel said nothing, unsure of what exactly Tao meant. He exited the doorway and disappeared for several moments. It was only when the squirrel heard the dull thud of a wooden door that she realized she had returned to his hut. He entered the farmhouse once he returned to his hut. He entered the farmhouse once again, this time carrying the tightly wrapped canvas that had brought with him from his homeland. It was only thought through magic that I escaped the encounter, though not in the manner I anticipated. Magic? Isabel tilted her head. Like those cards of yours. Tao hesitated, then nod, setting the canvas roll down on the table. Yes, the cards are unique in that regard. They are creatures, spells, promises, and places that I hold as personal marks. When death was inevitable, I wished to return home one last time. He pushed open the canvas, pulling out a card from the bottom of the deck. On the front, a stylized lion, likely meant to be Tao, was surrounded by tendrils of darkness. A pin of light grew at his feet, and the lion disappeared just as the darkness enveloped the card's frontage. Then the lion reappeared, the scene playing out over and over again. It should have sent me home, Tao continued, but I don't know why, but it sent me here. He gazed at the card in his paw, squinting as if searching for some detail he'd missed. I've tried using it again, you know, but it always sends me back to that spot in the woods. Silence once, m silence once more. Finally, Isabel stood and went to Tao. Then this is your home now. Tao took a sharp inward breath, voice cracking. And you've truly made it feel like one. I, I feel my labors are hardly enough to repay you for such kindness. Surely you're choking, Isabel offered a smile. You do more work than Gap and Prim combined. Because of you, we were able to plant that extra crop of barley in the next field over. She looked over the farm, the sun finally beginning to set behind them. The rat can will expect their share soon enough. Share of what? Tao looked confused. They don't own this farm. You do. I'd like to think that, the squirrel said, but the rat clan owns the land it's built on. What do they offer in return for this tax? Tao asked, hints of agitation in his voice. Do they protect you from harassment? Bandits? Anything at all? Isabel rolled her eyes. Come, Tao, surely you know. Know what? He pressed. I was a prince, not a thug. Our citizens received protection. Warriors were sent out to hunt thieves and brigands. Do these rats offer you anything in return for your hard-earned crops? 
They leave us alone, Isabel said, her voice cutting hard against Howe's idealistic tone. That is all we can ask for. That is all we can hope for. She gestured out, out into the dense fields. We start harvesting the winter wheat tomorrow. Some of it will be set aside, and I'll take it to Bryn's Watch. Bryn's Watch, Tao said. A town? A city, Isabel corrected. Used to be a small trading post a long time ago. It's right near the center of Amelo, so it's made life easier for everyone. Who controls it? Tao asked. The Rat Clan? Nobody, Isabel said. Well, no, everybody, actually. It's divided into four quarters, one for each of the clans. They run them like they run their own territories. Perhaps I should travel with you, Tao leaned in. If I speak with these rats, perhaps they can learn a thing or two. Isabel repeat rapidly shook her head. Oh, no, no, Tao. That is a... that would not be wise. Honestly, I, I worry what would happen if the Rat Clan found out about you. Me? Tao shrugged. Why is that... The Rat Clan likes... power. The squirrel turned back into the kitchen. And, well, there's nothing like you in the territories. She leaned back against the far wall, arms crossed. If they found out about you, I can almost guarantee they'll try to take you away from the farm and use you to... I don't know, enforce whatever it is they enforce. They would find such an act both difficult and unrewarding, Tao said defiantly. Even so, Isabel said, this is how it's been done. For generations, she approached Tao and put a paw on his arm. Please don't let it trouble you. Tao was silent for a long time, but appeared to drop the issue. Very well then, I shall retire. We've work we've early work tomorrow. When he moved to claim the canvas wrapping from the table, he stopped. His eyes shifted upwards, and he saw the squirrel was looking idly at the canvas between his paws. Go ahead, ask me. Isabel nodded. That first day, when you showed me that card in your collection. Tao nodded. What are you doing with such a ghastly, with such ghastly things in your possession? The lion glanced at the canvas folio for a moment, then proceeded to roll it up. The cards I possess re represent many things, Isabel, both good and bad. I'm not proud of that I have them, but they are relics of my homeland, relics I cannot so easily dismiss. The squirrel scru scrutinized his face. You keep those foul things even when they are so clearly associated with the rot. I must, he said. The cards cannot be destroyed, lest the magic in them be released, so I carry them for safekeeping. They are my burden to bear, Isabel, mine alone. I see, I think. Isabel looked concerned. I just wish you didn't have them, is all. Tao lifted the canvas roll and offered a tr deep, troubled sigh. I as well. This is far more than we agreed, the high, the voice, high-pitched strains, like claws sliding along the strings of a broken lute, was that of all Rat Clan authority in the city of Brimswatch. The spy master, v Vel Valentillon, uh, this is a pain in the ass, I'm just going to call him Velen, because I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that little bit at the end. Dressed in a simple silken black tunic, sat in an over-large wooden throne in the musty main room of the Rats Clan Hall. Therabed red carpet accented the otherwise drab browns and blacks of moldy rotten wood that held most of the Rat Clan quarter together. Isabel tried to keep to the carpet and stonework much as she could. Splinters, fungus, and other festering things held court all around her. She tried to look as calm and collected as possible, even with Velen pressing her for details. We've had a good harvest this season, Isabel finally responded. You always have good harvests, Velen said. You think we haven't seen it with our own eyes? Isabel was hardly surprised. The Rat Clan was not quick to trust by nature, and even after several generations of her family working in their shadow, they were continued to treat them like potential thieves. Because in the Rat Clan, everybody was. What I meant to say, Isabel tried not to sound flustered, is that because of our continual good harvests, I've been able to bring on extra help. I don't believe that's what you meant to say at all, Valen said. He cracked a grin, yellow teeth fitting right into the decay of the clan hole. But it makes some fragment of sense. Except... Except what, my lord? Valen ch chuckled at the strained my lord. 
except this is the work of three or four hired hands beyond those two louts you've got working for you now. He leaned forward menacingly. You wouldn't be able to do that without a fair pile of coin on your paws. Are you holding out on us? Isabel felt the fur on her neck stand on end. She sensed some of the clan rat guards moving in closer around her. I, um... I, I, um... You what? Felon asked, his smirk widening with perverse glee. I have but one new hand, though he is strong in ways Gap and Pym are not. The rat laughed. I have little difficulty imagining that. Very well, tell me of this new hired hand. The squirrel glanced to either side. The guard stared intently, unmoving. He is a stranger to these lands. I took him in and he's helped me in return. What manner of creature is he? To increase your yield so. The spy master leaned back in his wooden throne, loud creaks and groans reverberating throughout the hall. He is a lion, my lord. Isabel winced the moment she said it. A what? There was a murmur throughout the hall. Are you mocking me? A lying what? Not not lying lion. She announced it as clearly as she could. It's like a like a cat. A big cat. The the rat's murmuring persisted. But Valen was quiet, pondering to himself. Finally, after many agonizing moments, he threw an over-exaggerated shrug and stood up on the seat of his throne, just reaching Isabel's eye level. Miss Isabel, on behalf of the Rat Clan, I thank you for your over-generous payment. However, because this amount is so great, we must verify the remained, remainder of your harvest is adequate for your own needs. He narrowed his eyes, fixing them directly on the squirrel before him. What kind of ruler would I be if I did not look out for my own citizens? I don't understand, Isabel said, confused. We will be joining you back to your farm. The spy master smiled and hopped off the throne. With a snap of his claws, his guard assembled into a tight formation behind him, blocking Isabel in with them. We're going on a little road trip, you and I, and my guards. I trust you don't mind. The squirrel farmer knew trust had nothing to do with it. Tao was out amongst the remainder of the winter weeks when Isabel's caravan returned two days later. As the hot afternoon sun beat down on the open expanse of farmland, he continued sitting about r bundling sheaves of, while Gap and Pim picked weeds in the next field over. It was a shout from Isabel that drew his attention. His name. He looked up and waved instinctively, but his paw slowly fell when he saw the contingent of Rat Clan guards surrounding the squirrel. Isabel? He set the sheaves down and hurried over. Ah, so Velen's high-pitched voice came from behind one of the guards. The spy master leaned out and leaned back to meet the lion's curious gaze. This is the new farmhand. Marvelous creature. Absolutely fascinating. Tao glanced at Isabel, who shook her head and gestured back to the rat. Clearly this was somebody of import, considering her attitude and the quarter of the quarter, quartet of guards surrounding them. The lion hesitated, then offered a reverent bow. Honored, my lord, he said. Are you now? Velen crossed his arms, turning to Isabel. You've taught him proper manners, at least. The squirrel cleared her throat. He did not need prompting. Of course, the Rat Clan spymaster was dismissive. No matter, your master said your name was Tao? My master? Tao cast a suspicious glance at Isabel, who looked mortified. He's nobody's master, Isabel quickly corrected. He works for room and board. A slave by any other name, Fallon said. Tao, listen to me. How would you like to come to Brimswatch and work for me? Isabel looked on the verge of a panicked co comment, but Tao was quick to interject on her behalf, his voice terse. I am honoured by the thought my place is here. Valen's cheerful deme demeanour disappeared in an instant. It was no mere thought, Tao. He waved a paw at the endless fields around them. You work long days in this terrible sun, earning nothing but meals and a place to lay your head. I can offer you more than that. In Sprim's watch, you will have your own home, wealth and power fit for a king. Tao bolted upright for a moment, the rat's words striking at him. He sneered, something set off in his mind. I have no need for kingly niceties. His voice was low, growling. No go, get out of here before I... The guards were quick to draw their swords in response, cutting him off. 
Ver Valens shrunk back a bit in fear, but caught himself, quickly snapping to anger. Before you what? Who do you think you are? The rat turned angrily to Isabel. He'll accept, or with the world wild as my witness. She held up a halting paw. No need for unpleasantness, the squirrel sighed. Then step forward, step forward looking at, up at Tao. We need to go with them. Do I not have a choice? The lion spat the question out, already knowing the answer. He glowered at the spymaster. You think I would ever serve you? I think, Velen said, that I must remove the choice entirely. He nodded to the guards. We're taking the whole harvest. What? Isabel tried to step forward in protest, but the guards held her back. But how will we survive? Velen shrugged. Your big friend here will spend part of his earnings, send part of his earnings to you, and you will buy your food. He laughed. You should be thanking me, Isabel. You'll be able to live in comfort without working the fields. Tao scrawled. So long as I work for you. Exactly, the spy master nodded. You do what I say when I say it. That's all I ask. The lions watched the guards started fanning out. One of them was advancing on a rather terrified looking gap in Pimp. This was it. The end of Bellhaven Farm. Wait, Tao held up a paw. I have a better idea. What's that? Velen smirked. I do believe I've offered you the finest deal available. I'll go in peace, the lion said, but I wish to pledge my loyalty to you on parchment. The rat laughed. My, my, how official. Isabel? Tao turned to Isabel. Please go fetch the riding supplies from my hut. She blinked, looking uneasy. Are you certain? I am certain. Velen waved a paw, and the guards let her go. She returned a few short moments later, carrying Tao's canvas-wrapped supplies. Wordlessly, she gave to Tao and stepped back. Without pause, Tao unfurled it. The deck of enchanted cards was clearly visible. He glanced at Isabel, who was looking at him with dread. Velen caught this exchange. What is this? he demanded. What's going... Before he could finish, Tao had pulled the car a card out from the deck. He let the canvas fall to the ground, its contents scattering across the thick grass. Valen didn't know what was happening, but he knew that it was not what he expected. Hey, hey, stop! But there was nothing the guards could have done. Tao raised the card, and Isabel saw a familiar image on the front. The withered wanderers, the desolation of plague. The air around them grew vile and pe pestilent. The sky began to darken, the farm suddenly awash with a green hue. The guards suddenly began to choke. Valen screamed in terror, waving its paws around aimlessly, blinded by the darkness. Stop this! Isabella rushed forward and grabbed the lion's forearm. Tao, you'll destroy the farm! You'll destroy everything! The sun reappeared in an instant, and the air was again fresh with the scent of wildflower and barley. The Rat Clan guards coughed and wheezed, collapsed on the ground. Velen was frozen in place, shaking like a leaf in the wind. Tao flipped the card in his claws, bowing his head to Isabel. I'm sorry. The squirrel was mortified as well. She had heard of the rot of powerful magic dredged from the foulest corners of the world. But she had never once believed it to be real, merely the product of fever dreams and nightmares. And yet, right before her, the nightmare had manifested before her very eyes. The lion pulled away from her grip, kneeling down to the fallen canvas. He set the vile card inside, shoved the scattered items within, then rolled it tight. I just... I didn't want them to... I know, Isabel said. She tried to think of something else to say, but her attention was quickly returned to Valen. The spymaster was still staring at Tao in mortal fear. The lion followed her gaze and sneered at the rat. Consider yourselves lucky, he growled. Miss Isabel has spared you. I thank you? The spy master took a hesitant step backwards. Now listen well, Tao said, striding, o striding over to the cowering rat. He grabbed a paw full of Valen's silken tunic and lifted him to eye level. This farm is now off limits. You no longer require tax from Miss Isabel. Your guards will no longer harass Miss Isabel or her farmhands. He leaned in, their eyes only a hair apart. Say you understand. I understand. 
Tao dropped the spymaster unceremoniously to the ground. Valen scrambled to his feet and scurried off without another word. His guards, now recovered from the episode, stumbled after him into the woods. What? What was that? Gap walked up to them. Prim cowering behind. Was was that the ro Give us a moment, please. Isabel waved them off. Go. The two farmhands hurried away across the fields. After a moment, Tao and Isabel were alone. You need to go, Tao. The lion's gaze fell to the ground. I know. I appreciate what you did. She put a paw on his arm. I really do. I know, Tao repeated. Thank you for everything. Isabel wiped away a tear. I just did what any decent creature would do. You are beyond decent, Tao said. You are exceptional. I do not deserve to be in your company after what I've done. Tao, she tried to think of something, anything to say, but couldn't. The lion turned and rolled up canvas under his arm, walked to his hut. He did not fuss or cu curse. This was the path he knew he had chosen to take the moment he drew the card. As dawn arose the next morning, he was gone. In the many months that Tao had lived on Bellhaven Farm, he had never wandered beyond its borders. Now he was alone, carrying only a small folio and the travelling supplies wordlessly offered to him by Isabel the night before he left. He wandered for days across Verdun's plains and vile swamps, thick forests and rocky crags. Soon he was beyond the reach of the Rat Clan, a massive stone monolith branded with the Wolf Clan sigil marking the edge of their territory. Unfortunately, as Tao was quick to find out, the, the, the border markers meant little in these lands. As he climbed over yet another hill to see yet another green fi endless green field, he noticed three cage wagons trundling along the well-worn path to the east. Massive boars and yaks hefted the wagons at the front, while a half-dozen rat-clan mercenaries held court at the front and back armed with swords and crossbows. A few ferrets and weasels, all bearing the sigil of the rat-clan on cheaply made iron armor. Before Tao realized what it was he was looking at, one of the mercenaries pointed at him from afar. Hey, you there! Not a step or we'll fill you full of bolts! The crossbows went up in unison. It was then that Tao noticed the cage wagons were filled with living creatures, sad faces pressed against the bars. Slavers. Tao felt his paws curling up into fists. He had no weapons on him, save for his cards, but retrieving them would require movement. Something that was unavailable to him with so many crossbows aimed so precisely. A trio of the Rat Clan mercenaries approached, two weasels with crossbows that which never faltered from his chest, and their leader, a ferret with a spear. The ferret looked Tao up and down. What are you supposed to be, eh? Tao was silent. The wagons hadn't stopped moving, all the tension focused on him. I asked you a question, cat. The ferrets at the force poked him with the half, haft of his spear. Maybe he don't speak, one of the ferret weasels shrugged. That's fine by me, the ferret said. Overseer at the mines love it when they don't speak. Makes it easy to keep him in line. He nodded back to the wagons. All right, cat, you're coming with us. Bad day for you, great day for us. The ferret held up his spear into the lion's face, reaching out to grab the canvas roll with his paws. Tao glanced at it, then at the two weasels. He grabbed the spear and wrenched it from the ferret's gri grip without paws, his strength far out matching the lanky creature. With a death sweep, he slammed it into the nearest crossbow, sending its bolt flying high over his shoulder. Tao spun to the side, closing the distance with the remaining weasel grabbing his crossbow with a free paw and sending his elbow into the creature's teeth. The weasel fell to the ground in a heap, and the crossbow bolt fired off into the distance. Watch it! Watch it! The ferret was trying to run back to the wagon, but Tao's spear found his legs before he got too far. The mercenary went down, and Tao was, had already moved back to the front w first weasel, who was frantically trying to reload a bolt into his crossbow. Tao's paw wrapped around the flimsy wooden device, and he crushed it between his claws. The weasel dropped the useless hunk of splintered wood and held up his arms in defeat. A bolt struck the dirt nearby, and Tao was quick to turn his attention to the mercenary's guy in the wagon. He dropped the spear and grabbed the remaining weasel with one paw, hoisting him up by his cheap iron breastplate. 
Tao strode forward and picked up the fallen ferret with his other paw. He held the two pathetic beasts up before him, a pair of living shields. The mercenaries continued to lose their bolts at him in, the ma in a mad panic, but all it did was remove two of their own from the battle permanently. Tao closed the distance to the wagon in short order. There were three mercenaries left. The beasts of burden had, perhaps sensing an opportunity to escape their vile captives, fled into the fields while the weasels and ferrets were properly distracted. Tao threw one of his now expired shields into the nearest ab obelisk, slamming them into the side of the wagon. Countless arms snaked out from between the, wood the window bars, grabbing the mercenary and pinning them to the wagon, choking the life from him. He's tearing us apart! Kill him! Kill... Tao grabbed the pin obelisk's crossbow and fired at the shrieking ferret, silencing him in an instant. Only one left now. The last slaver, a ferret with a wooden spear, shivered and quaked as, Tao's, as Tao approached him. He tried to find words, but only managed to stammer incessantly. Tao grabbed the ferret's spear and quickly snapped it in half across his knee, dropping the useless pieces to either side. His paw shut out then. The ferret th thought his neck was about to be snapped like a twig, but the paw was open-palmed. The slaver regarded it with a sense of morbid curiosity. Keys, Tao said. Uh, uh, oh The ferret looked down at his belt, where a ring of burnished diminished keys hung. They jingled harmoniously in his shaking paw when he dislodged them and held them aloft. <laughs> As Tao snatched the iron ring from the ferret, he wrapped his paw fully around the jailer's forearm. My thanks. He pulled the creature in close and slammed his head into the ferret's skull. The ferret collapsed to the ground as if he had been poleaxed. Without a moment's hesitation, Tao walked back around to the front of the wagons in the caravan. Countless faces were pressed up against the bars, their expressions a mix between hope and fear. There was only a half dozen keys on the ring, so it did not take long for Tao to pop open the lock to the first wagon. He threw open the door, stepped back, waving a paw towards him. Come, come, but the captive creatures howled within the wagon, shrinking back at their strange saviour. Right, enough of that, a new voice chimed in from the next wagon over. It was a young rabbit, his face nearly squeezing through the bars of the side window. Hey, come on, get moving, this slug won't hurt you. He shifted his gaze to Tao. You won't hurt them, will you? Of course not, Tao tried to smile, to offer up a calm, collected demeanor. You're free now. Those beasts can't hurt you anymore. Alima pressed his, pressed his way forward through the crowd and stepped gingerly out of the wagon, looking up at the lion before him with awe. The others filed out after him, some shying away from the fallen slavers, others kicking them to make sure they were down for good. A few started pulling supplies off the wagon, knowing they were in for a long journey home. Tao walked over to the rabbit's wagon and unlocked it, the crowd emptying out diligently. Go on, get moving. Out, out, out. Please, thank you. The rabbit kept at the far end, making sure everyone was out of the wagon. Finally, ensuring everyone was freed, he hopped out, passed Tao, and grabbed the keys out of his paw. Come on, one more. The rabbit bounded over to the final locked wagon and opened the door. The creatures within murmured with suspicion at their curious savour, but didn't tarry nearly as long as the wagon, with the, long within the wagon with the rabbit opening the door for them. They con congregated together in the field, separated family members crying and hugging one another in relief at their good fortune. Tao held back, and the rabbit stepped alongside him. Mother's flint runner, by the way. He raised an open paw skyward to Tao, who clasped it. Tao. Tao, huh? Funny name. Where I come from, Martha's Flint Runner would be a funny name. I feel like we're learning a lot about each other, but Martha's gestured ahead. You've got an admirer. True enough, a bear was approaching them from the crowd of freed slaves. He had black fur and wore a red hooded scroll, and was the first creature Tao had seen in the territories that was as tall as he was. Forgive my interruption, the bear said. I... we... He gestured back at the crowd, which quietly observed from afar. We thank you for what you did. Of course, Tao said. Are you fit to travel back to your homes? The bear nodded. We will help each other, other back to Brim Watch. The bear clan stands ready to aid these poor souls whenever, wherever we can. He bowed. I am U Urash, stone speaker of the bear clan. 
Stone speaker? Arthur mused. You mean one of those loonies who talked to the blue eggs? Spirit stones? Urash said, his voice taking on a sharper edge. They are attuned directly with the world. To speak to them is to commune with life itself. You talk to rocks, Martha shrugged. Either way. Either way, Tao interrupted the rabbit and returned Urush's bow. I am Tao, and I hope your journey to Brim's Watch is a safe one. Urash couldn't help but smile at the exchange. Much appreciated. Should your travels take you to Brim's Watch, be sure to visit Wild Tree Hole in the Bear Clan quarter. Such bravery deserves a just reward. Tao nodded. I shall keep that in mind, friend. Until then. Urash left the two alone and returned to the slaves gathered nearby. They had taken their abductors' food and supplies, and were now more than ready to begin the trek back to Brimswatch. You're not going with them? Marthas asked. We're not going with them? Marthas asked. We? Um, yeah, the rabbit sounded incredulous. Listen, I don't know anything about you other than you're really big and you're good at killing things, but I'm gonna guess you don't know anything about how the clan territories work. What makes you say that? You attacked a rat clan slave caravan, Martha suggested to the grisly scene around them. So if it's a, sort of an unspoken rule, you leave these folks alone. Tao raised an eyebrow. The wolf clan accepts these cl rat clan incursions? Martha shrugged. Well, see, the higher-ups don't really know about these things. That's also a sort of unspoken rule. The lion shrugged and looked up to the sky. The sun was close to the horizon now. Night was not far off. Seems there are a lot of unspoken rules. Exactly my point, Martha said. You need someone to help keep you out of trouble, and I'm just the rapper to do it. He puffed his chest. You see, I was a courtier for the Elder Flintrunners in the Sandstone Warren, before the, that warmongering Javis Jasperpore took over the House of Heritage. Tao blinked. I have no idea what you just said. Ah. Marthas took a breath and considered his words. In the distance, the slaves, led by Urash, were gro growing small across the field. Tell you what, let's put some distance between us and these corpses and set up camp. I'll give you a primer. On what? The rabbit grinned. Everything. They'd set up camp a good distance away from the caravan, under a large, rocky outcropping. Their fire was small, but inadequately warm as the chill of late summer nights made its presence known. The moment the kindling had caught, Marthas had begun talking, and an hour later he had not ceased. Bear, rat, wolf, rat, and rabbit, Marthas repeated, for what felt like the tenth time. They set up their little fiefdoms and brims watch, and the piece has been... tenuous at best. I understand that nobody rules Brim's Watch, Chow said. That it's a kind of shared responsibility. A shared piece. Martha sneered a bit, fraining an over-exaggerated ga gag. Responsibility? Nobody there's responsible. Not for anything good, anyway. As for peace, well... He dragged a, clo a toe claw through the dirt and drew a big circle, then, bored his two line through, then drew two lines through it and, acro and across. Borders create conflict, and Brim's Watch is surrounded by four borders. Where the lines met in the center, he stomped his foot. And there's not even the and that's not even the worst of it. He looked res res expectantly at Tao, then to his rucksack. I'm kind of peckish, actually. The lion rolled his eyes, reaching into the haversack and pulled out a wrapped wedge of aged cheese and a spongy rye. He tore both in half and off the split to Marthas. So what is the worst of it? Assuming you aren't actually referring to your empty stomach. Martha shoved the cheese and bread into his mouth spontaneously, preventing any re recognizable words from ex exiting the rabbit's mouth for several long, awkward moments. Tao took the opportunity to get in a few bites of food himself. The worst thing, Martha's finally managed, mouth still half full, cheeks stretched to capacity, is that peace is impossible. Nobody trusts anyone, because every species in Armello is allied to one clan or another. To top it off, none of the local clan leaders want peace. The elders and sages blame a bunch of ancient evil nonsense. They say an ancient vile presence of the rot called the Bane of Brimswatch drives the clans to endless conflict. But really it's just the clan leaders not wanting to cede power. What do you mean? Tao swallowed and reached for a nearby flask of water. Who wouldn't desire peace? You are new here, Martha smirked. Where to start? 
He waved a paw dramatically. The Wolf Clan, Lady Bo Boreal, Alpha of her pack, leader of the Brim's Watch Wolves. The rabbit leaned in, the light of the fire casting menacing shadows and shapes over his face. She's a monster. A monster? Barathus nodded. If you're not a wolf in her, her part of Brim's Watch, you'll be harassed by her pack. No questions about it. She likes to arrest members of the other clans on false charges, torture them, and leave them to rot in her dungeons. He raised his paws high. Then she likes to string up the corpses near the clan hall, warning for folks to never cross her. Teal squinted in the harsh firelight. Is there no decent wolf among her pack? Her second in command, Captain Rill, her name is. I hear she's actually quite reasonable, but she answers to Lady Boreal. He shivered. And Boreal would sooner cut her own throat than sign any pe some peace accord with the other clans. And with control of all the gold veins running under Brim's watch, Boreal holds a lot of power when it comes to trade. Wolf clan marks are valued above the other clan currencies three to one. Is there nothing Boreal fears? Tao tapped a, cla a claw on his knee, deep in thought. Hmm, the clan Alpha, maybe? Martha shrugged. Craig Greymane's his name. Rules the Wolf Clan territory way up north from Spire Stone Bluffs. He's a bit isola isolationist, though. How so? The wolves don't really see what happens down here as important, the rabbit clarified. That's how Boreal gained so much authority in Armello. Even calls herself an Alpha. and the Wolf Clan, there's only ever one Alpha. But since Craig is too focused on Wolf Clan business up north, there's been a kind of split. Interesting, Tao said. He looked pensive, but quickly changed the subject. Right, so what of the rabbits? You said you were a courier of the f of the Flint Runners. Well, yes, Martha snorted. He held up a piece of grey rock, carved into a fa fa facsimile of a rabbit. It's the symbol of our house. We carry it with us to remind us of a time when the Flint Runners actually meant something in the Rabbit Clan. He turned the carved flint over and over in his paws, a wistful sigh escaping him. We're still powerful, but not nearly as powerful as the Jasper Claws. They led a coup in the House of Heritage and took it over for themselves, so now there won't be any peace between them and the other clans. The House of Heritage? The rabbit shrugged and shook his head, like he couldn't imagine a world where the intricacies of the Rabbit Clan's parliamentary system escaped any creature in a mellow. The most powerful Rabbit Clan families get to pass the laws before their warren. Normally, it's a few different families sharing the responsibility, but just because we're able to bribe, cheat, and blackmail the other families. So now nothing happens there without their say-so. But they can only pass laws for the warren they lead, Tao started. What about other warrens? Is there some kind of, I don't know, all-encompassing Rabbit Clan authority? Martha smiled and nodded. The house above, it's called. They deal with matters that affect the Rabbit Clan as a whole. So things like diplomacy between clan leaders, stopping plagues from spreading, clamping down on tra clan traitors, that sort of thing. The rabbit sighed, the flint carving passed between his paws as he spoke. Rowian Blackspur is what we call the Voice of the Thousand, represents the whole of the Rabbit Clan. Should have stepped in long ago to stop the Jasper Claws from taking over, I think. Why hasn't she? Tao asked. Because the Jasper Claws have power, Martha said, and even the Voice of the Thousand is subject to her own people. I understand, I think, Tao moved on that. So how are the Jasper Claws in an obstacle to peace in Brimswatch? They want to expand the Warren, Martha said. The stone, the sandstone warren, that is. Very nice. Good craftsmanship. I don't care. Right, right, the rabbit continued. He fiddled with the flint carving in his paws. The jasper claws dig outward, and since the warren is underground, borders are hard to enforce. So they've got enemies in the wolf clan and rat clan, since they're digging right under their territory. They keep digging and digging and digging. Sooner or later, the wolves of the rats will realize just how far into the territory the warren goes, and... Well, he trailed off, grimacing. Tao, to ah. Tao tossed over the w water flask. So the Jasper Claws control the Sandstone Warren. They won't stop expanding, even if it means pe if it means peace for all. And Rowena Blackspur won't step in to stop them. Precisely, Martha said. He took a swig of the water and wiped his lips. Not to mention that the Jasper Claws have a treaty with Irona Wildcaller, head of the Bear Clan. 
Everyone knows the bears never fight in any wars, but if there's an attack on the Sandstone Warren, the bear clan's supposed to step in to make sure things... Uh, get back to the status quo. It's never gone that far, though. Nobody wants to see their scar castles or wild whatever's in a real fight. So it's fa so it's fear that keeps everyone in check, Tao nodded. Does Amelia hold court in Bl Brimwatch? Martha shook his head. Nah, she's over in Wild Tree, the Bear Clan capital. Doesn't travel to Brimwatch too often. Think she finds the growth and industry there a bit too modern for her tastes. I see. And what about the Rat Clan? Martha's polished off the rest of his dinner, barely chewing it. The spy master has his claws in the criminal underbellies of the other clans. He's untouchable. The spy master? You mean Velen? The lion tilted his head a bit. This caught the rev by surprise. Um, yeah. Martha's tossed the water back to Tao. How is it that you know absolutely nothing about Brim's w Brimwatch, except the name of the most powerful secret of Ratana Mellow? Tao shrugged. I almost killed him a few weeks ago. Martha stared blankly at the lion. You... Almost. The lion nodded. Almost. Well, Martha matched the nod. That's the same as saying you didn't kill him. He shrugged. So that's good, he yawned. Maybe let's avoid him for the time being anyway. So Velen is the head of the Rat Clan in Brimswatch then? In, Br in Brimswatch, sure, Martha said. But everyone knows the real power of the Rat Clan comes from the nine families that rule Rat territory to the east. Every once in a while, they send their ambassador into Brimswatch to see how old Velen is holding up shop. I hear he gets a good bit nervous. Tao smirked at the thought. They don't trust him. Rats don't trust rats, Martha said sh sagely. Anyway, the ambassador's name is, um, Peretzi, I think? It changes a lot, though. Could be someone different by now. Martha yawned again, this time a good deal more forcefully. But take my advice, Tao. I'm only tell telling you think so you're informed. Let's do our best to never meet any of these creatures in person. Oh, Tao offered dis a disarming smile. Of course. While Martha slept, Tao remained awake, thinking. The scars cast their nets of light across the vast night sky. Since arriving in Armello, he had tried to pick out familiar stars or constellations, but even the sky was different than the one he remembered back home. The rabbit was snoring fiercely on the other side of their small campsite, but that wasn't what kept Tao awake. The lion was contemplating everything Marthas had told him. Brim's Watch, Lady Boreal, the Jasper Claws, Velen, that Bear Clan's treaty with the Rabbit Clan. Marthas had, perhaps unknowingly, laid out a rather convincing case. There were obstacles to peace in Armello, personif personified by but a handful of problems, all of which necessitated their own solutions. These solutions were not unattainable by any means, quite the contrary. As the moon made its way across the night sky, Tao's mind was filled with possibilities, plans, and finally, resolve. He reached over to his art supplies and rolled them open. By the time the, s the sun rose over the distant horizon, Tao had made a decision. Martha barely had time to rub his eyes of sleep before the lion appeared, looming over him. We're going to Brim's watch. We are? Tao held out a paw to help him up. You're taking me to the Bear Clan quarter. I wish to speak to Orash. Marthas nodded, uh, considered this, shrugged, then nodded in, in approval. Ah, yes, fine, good. If you're going to make nice with anyone in Brimswatch, the Bear Clan's as benign as it gets. The rabbits sto stomped out their campfire, kicking dirt and sand over top of it. The city's not too far away. Think we could make it by mid-afternoon if we hurry. Then hurry we shall, Tal said. It would be impolite to keep them waiting. To be continued in the King Part 2. And that is the King Part 1. And I think that's where we'll leave this episode here. If anyone wants to hear Part 2 of the story, or just wants me to read the other stories that are present in this, in this game, but please comment down below. But until then, my name is Brett Ops, and I look forward to hearing from you. Take care.